Hey, good morning. Welcome to the Mufasa uh, close-up meeting. Mufasa is one of our Work Package E projects. Multi-dimensional framework for advanced CESAR automation. It's also the Lion King and uh, Brian has managed to put all the Lion King characters in a meaningful role and they also stand, the acronym actually stands for something, so that's quite remarkable. But apart from that, Mufasa has also produced some uh, very interesting scientific results. The presentation will be given by Brian Hilburn from the Center of Human Performance Research. I think most of you know Brian. Uh, we have a working relationship for, uh, with him for many years. Many years. Uh, the uh, project leader is Debbie Hockney from Lockheed Martin UK. And I'd also like to acknowledge Robin Garrity from the, from the SG. So, um, enjoy. Thank you, Dirk. Welcome, everyone. As Dirk said, I'll be discussing the results and conclusions from the Mufasa project the multidimensional framework for advanced CESAR automation. Mufasa was a 27-month project recently completed, run under the aegis of the WPE program, as you know, with partners including Lockheed Martin UK, Technical University of Delft, CHPR, also in the Netherlands, the Irish Aviation Agency, and we interacted closely with the HALA network. Roughly 60 years ago, the English mathematician Alan Turing put forward what is still the ultimate test for artificial intelligence, that if a person can interact with a computer, speak to a computer, and mistake computer for human responses, that is not know for sure whether behind the curtain is actually a human or a computer, that computer couldn't be said to think, to actually think. Now this notion is driven thinking into artificial intelligence for over 50 years or so. It's worthwhile noting though that even today no computers managed to pass that Turing test still. Um, and in some sense we haven't achieved the highest levels of automation. Having said that, obviously we've, we've come a long way. Automation in our planes, our trains, even our automobiles is far more capable than ever before and it's able to take over some of the strategic, the thinking, the cognitive parts of what used to be done, the tasks that used to be done by humans. And that's where Mufasa comes in. Mufasa owes uh, some gratitude to past efforts. One in particular project by the name of Cora was run some years ago here out of Brittany. Cora, the controller resolution assistant, tried to integrate medium-term conflict detection with advisory capacity. And Cora was carried out in two phases. In the first phase, the system would simply identify highlight conflicts. In the second phase, so you see where it's becoming strategic advisory, it would actually set out to present advisories to the controller about how to resolve conflicts. There's a quote I like from Thomas Sheridan, a professor emeritus at MIT, who said some years ago, Basically, we can't create automation at the highest levels because we don't know how to do it. We can't create software that can run companies, he said, or that can write a Mahler symphony or care for your child. Can't be done. But what if we could? What if we could? That was the premise for Mufasa. Let's forget about the fact that it's impossible. What if we could? <laughs> um, what would the impact be? Namely, would controllers ever accept, would humans more generally ever accept automation that thinks exactly the way they do? Now to test this notion, you'd have to remove any logical basis on which to fault automation. You'd need perfect automation that not only solves a conflict, I'm thinking now of air traffic control, not only solves a conflict perfectly, but solves it in a way that perfectly matches the controller's own strategy. That's the big question which required a big deception along the way. Basically, our trick, the trick behind Mufasa, was to capture controllers' performance, replay it to them, tell them that it was automation, thereby logically controlling for differences in strategy and approach. This required a bit of subterfuge, um, a lot of stealth, and a um, cloak of secrecy over the Irish air traffic control community for some months last year. Now, Mufasa varied, as I'll, I'll mention in a moment, um, looked at the interactive effect of three factors, the first one of which was levels of automation. 
I'm not going to go into this much other than I mentioned that you can find further details in the reports, the deliverables that are available here for those of you present today and also online, presumably from the normal Eurocontrol links. Over the years, there have been a number of levels of automation or taxonomies of automation put forward. These all seek to characterize automation, typically on a level from fully manual, the person does it all him or herself, to the HAL 9000, the uh, uh, completely autonomous system that takes uh, complete can charge, has full authority and full autonomy. That is, it can implement and it, it might not even tell the human about what it's done. More current day and realistically, we're at about this level, what Sheridan characterized as levels five to seven. Um, management by consent, management by, by exception sort of levels, which refer specifically to, uh, or respectively to automation that does something if you consent. That is, it will, uh, it will do it if you say, if the human says it's okay. Or management by exception. The computer will do it unless you tell it to stop. Now, notice that this, uh, this sort of taxonomy has an analog in the CESAR service levels, which step from, uh, from one to five and mirror pretty nicely the presumed increase in automation that's going to be required over the development and evolution of CESAR. So I want to make the point at the outset that this is more than an academic question. It's not just about running a nice Turing test type of experiment, but there is actually reason to, theoretical operational reasons to question whether controllers would in fact accept automation. A, it's coming, and B, it's likely to be more advanced and take over many of the strategic aspects of the job. Now, Mufasa looked at, at three factors and the interaction between them. Levels of automation, complexity. I won't go into the broad background on complexity. Suffice it to say that it's been studied for probably 60 plus years. There have been a number of literature reviews compiled over the years. One in which I was involved myself some years ago found 110, slightly over 110 different factors that drive complexity. Complexity is thought to be the characteristics of the airspace and the traffic pattern that contribute to a controller's workload. The third of the three interacting factors we wanted to investigate was this notion of strategic conformance. This is a construct, as we defined it, it is the degree to which automation appears in both its behavior and its underlying, apparent underlying mechanisms to mirror those of the human. So that is, does the machine seem to be working in the way the human would? Does it seem to conform to the strategy the human has? And this was really the most important of the three for us. Uh, there had been some work done over the years. Barry Kerwin, for one, has looked into the role of this with respect to the Cora project and how strategies matched. The notion is sometimes put forward of algorithmic versus heuristic, machine ways of working versus human ways of working, and the need to look at strategic conformance fits under that broad rubric. I'll only dwell on this a moment to, to say that we started with a, a functional model of how a controller comes to evaluate and decide to use or not use automation at any given point in a single trial. There are external factors below this dashed line having to do with things like complexity, the level of automation, that is the external demands, as well as internal factors, strategies, control strategies, what Kerwin called the, the no-nos, things that controllers know not to do, um, as well as automation strategy. Um, which is comprised of both uh, evolving, developing trust. You watch how something performs. You make inferences about the underlying process and so forth. But it also has to do with a longer term notion of dispositional trust, as it's been called. Um, that is the, the long term tendency to either use or not use automation. It's the bias. I don't want to use it um, just in general. Um, these all feed into strategies and eventually the, the choice of whether to use or not use automation on a given trial. I will now briefly introduce the test bed for this work. My colleagues at Technical University of Delft have been working for some years on development of a prototype interface for the cockpit and ground to facilitate conflict avoidance. It's called the Solution Space Diagram, or SSD. 
It's a Java-based simulation, which we had to tweak and modify quite a bit for purposes of the Mufasa project and anticipated ongoing work. Things like automation, things like the simulation capability, all had to be added to it. Well, I can explain to you briefly what you're looking at. This is supposed to be comparable to a PVD, plan view display for a controller. What you see here, of course, are leader lines and flight data blocks and so forth. Standard stuff. What you also see down here, open at the moment, is a uh, conflict display. Basically, what happens is a vector is drawn to an observed aircraft and a conflict avoidance path is drawn. There's a triangle formed by the protected zone of an observed aircraft. And if your anticipated trajectory intercepts that triangle formed by the tangents off the protected zone of the observed aircraft, you're going to be in conflict. And I encourage you to look at the reports for, for more information. And this is one of those cases where a picture is worth more than a thousand words. It's far more intuitive to see than to hear me tell you about it. Basically what's happening here is that you've got avoidance go and no-go regions being indicated to the controller. In the case of Mufasa, yellow is indicating a conflict on the order of one to five minutes and a red is a short term, i.e. less than one minute conflict anticipated. Basically, the controller's task in Mufasa became one of choosing a go area. The red area here would create a short-term conflict, presumably with this aircraft. This would create a longer-term conflict with something up there and so forth. The lines have to do with the secondary task. I'll mention that in a minute. But basically, when in running Mufasa, we had two tasks. One was conflict avoidance. The other was clearing aircraft to their respective exit points here at the perimeter. Well, let me take a moment and explain in a bit more detail what the system is doing then. This again is the, the SSD. You see a number of aircraft here. When you get a conflict, you're instructed in the form of an advisory, a, a magenta line, and the controller can either accept that or not. We have some buttons that appear on screen and that allow the controller to either accept or reject in one case. In the case of uh, management by consent, they have to specifically reject it. You see current and advised headings there. Okay, I'd now like to take a moment to show you the uh, plan view display as part of the SSD. As I was describing, the SSD consists of resolution rings. When a controller hovers over or near a, um, a plot, the ring appears around an aircraft, indicating short and long-term conflicts in um, red and yellow uh, rings, respectively. You also see here in the bottom right of the screen that this aircraft is getting an advisory. You also see at the moment an adjustment in, in speed. The interface permits both heading and speed resolutions. And as you saw just a moment ago, as the controller mouses back and forth on the, on the, the mouse wheel, the scroll wheel, um, the system projects the conflict areas, which, can, which of course can change depending on the speed. Uh, and you see there an inner and outer band. You probably can't tell at the moment, but it makes a slight difference in the, uh, the eventual conflict region. Here again you see an, an advisory. Uh, the system is advising a slight heading change and indicating potential conflict areas, no-go areas, red being short-term and again yellow being medium-term, defined as one and one to five minutes. Look ahead. There you just saw an aircraft get and re uh, a controller get and respond to an advisory. This is not a conflict advisory. Um, in fact, what it was was simply the, um, the heading to its assigned exit point. Okay, and I think that's self-explanatory. We'll now get back to the presentation. The project itself was carried out in three phases. And yes, those of you with children of a certain age will recognize the acronyms underlying the Mufasa project. If you don't have any good content, at least you should have good acronyms. Simba, Pumba, and Nala were the three simulations. By the way, for extra credit, those of you who recall the SCAR character were strategic conflict advisory resolutions. 
basically we ran two developmental studies. The first with aerospace students at, at TU Delft, just a few of them, to dial in and tweak the interface because there was a lot of work needed to set up the SIM, set up the HMI, set traffic levels appropriately. And keep in mind that we had to tweak things to a point where it would be difficult enough that controllers would feel the need to actually use the automation. Um, so it took some iterative testing to set traffic levels appropriately and to iron out the experimental protocol instructions and so forth. We then went to Brussels headquarters, Eurocontrol headquarters, for a second round, the Pumba round of uh, trials, where we wanted to first look at a more representative population, namely retired controllers at Eurocontrol. We were hoping that they would give us some insights into what kinds of strategies controllers used. And again, it became a question of tweaking. We set out with a lot of unknowns in this project, I have to say, uh, which was part of the challenge and the fun along the way. We didn't know that we could sufficiently tweak traffic levels that controllers would use automation. We didn't know that there would be sufficient strategy differences from one controller to the next for us to use the experimental protocol we ultimately wanted to. And to preview that, basically, we needed controllers to act differently because we wanted to specifically manipulate strategic conformance. And as I told you before, we replayed controllers previous performance and called it automation. In particular, what we called it was conformal automation, automation that conforms to your way of working. But we needed something to represent non-conformal automation, automation that worked well, it solved the problem in a way a controller would, but just not the way you would necessarily. And the way we would do that is to use a different strategy. Um, if you solved the problem differently than you did, Yours was a non-conformal solution. You still avoided the conflict, but you turned right 15 degrees instead of um, descending an aircraft, let's say. For that reason, we had hoped, but weren't sure, that controllers, real-ish controllers, if you will, retired controllers, would show some variability in the strategies they used. And we further had to work at establishing appropriate complexity levels for the, the ultimate study, the NALA study. First time that we used advisory automation in anger, for real, in Ireland, January and February of 2013, we ran a set of trials in two phases. Basically, in the first phase, what we had to do was capture controllers' behavior, capture their resolutions. We went away for a week, created the advisory level scenarios, came back to them with automation. Yes, it's a potential confound, by the way, for those of you keeping score. Automation had to come after manual condition in our study. Simba and Pumba results. So that is with the aerospace students at Delft, two of them. With the retired controllers in Brussels, three of them. I'll briefly run over some of the results from those trials. First was that the controllers inspected the SSD more frequently. Actually, it's more times total, which is more frequent and more in total than did the aerospace students. You can see the differences there in terms of absolute numbers. We had actually suspected that students, you know, one, one traditional school of thought is that experts have a hard time transferring to new ways of working. There can be some negative transfer. There can be reluctance to use a new tool. Uh, that wasn't the case in, in the uh, admittedly small numbers we saw, but that wasn't the case. It could be the difference in controllers and students, or it could be age. Absolutely. Absolutely. And with, a, with uh, ends of two and three, that is a total of five participants, we are very reluctant to draw many um, conclusions. And that wasn't the main point of the Simba and the Pumba. It was more we were using it as a chance, again, to dial in the complexity levels, hammer out the, the experimental protocol, and so on. But everybody likes results graphs. We also found that controllers were much more likely to rely on heading commands. One of our controllers, it should be noted because it is possibly linked to the range of strategies used, was a, an approach controller. They might be more inclined to use speed resolutions than would an en route controller. Again, it's an N of 5. We're not inclined to make so much of it, and it's sort of secondary to the main focus, which was to dial in our methods. But it is interesting that students use more different kinds of clearances and more combined clearances, i.e. combined speed and heading together. We also found a range of different resolution strategies. Sometimes controllers would turn one aircraft, sometimes they would turn another. 
Sometimes a controller will resolve one conflict and cause a knock-on conflict with a noise aircraft. The point being that they would solve the resolutions in different ways. Very few times, I should mention, was there no resolution achieved. That is, controllers generally resolved conflicts. But within a given controller, you could see differences from one to the next given the same pair. So this picture is one controller, same conflict? No. This is three controllers, same conflict, right? Two aircraft, A and B, are approaching one another. One controller does these, one controller does this. So this controller chose to turn aircraft B, this one chose to turn aircraft A. And one thing I should mention before I forget is that but the interface also permits speed manipulations. The, the heading resolution mechanism is fairly intuitive. You get it, the red and the yellow, and you just have to point. For instance, there's a gap, there's a small go area. If you were to change the heading of this aircraft to there, you could shoot the gap and um, remain conflict free. You could also, by rolling the mouse in and out, expand or contract these rings. The ring would scroll bigger or smaller in diameter, referring to the um, a speed resolution. And you have to see it um, to understand it completely, but basically that changes the shape of the, the resolution triangle. Obviously, speed will have an impact on where you should be in the future to resolve it. Um, but suffice to say that controllers could either change heading or scrolling in and out change uh, speed to resolve conflicts. So that, that was the whole point of that, just that controllers solve things differently. And these were three conflict pairs. Yeah, it's still interesting to know how often one controller chooses different strategies for the same conflict. Have you been looking through my slides? <laughs> I'm waiting. <laughs> That's one of the key questions, is variability within controllers, actually. And I should mention that at the, actually, the project kickoff, put in March 2011, Jean-Luc, the earlier coordinators of the project, now retired, mentioned this as a possibility. He said, if you do find that controllers disagree with themselves, it could be that controllers don't like automation, or it could be that controllers just don't know what they want 10 minutes later. That is, there's intra-controller variability. A controller will come up with a different solution five minutes later. They're not fixed in terms of strategy. And that's a potential confound in our results for sure. If controllers are that variable that we can't count on them to give us the same resolution every five minutes, it limits our ability to, to do what we did. Debrief, basically, controllers especially were skeptical about SSD and relied on judgment. Not so surprising. This was a very quick and dirty trial we did at Brussels with some retired controllers in their offices. Training time was minimized. As a result, it's not surprising that they would have tended to rely more on their old-fashioned ways of working, if you will. On to Nala, the final of the three sims that we ran, and really the heart of the project. This was our big show. After all of the dress rehearsals in Delft and Brussels, we went to Ireland for a few weeks. I managed to get 16 en route controllers, the same 16, two or three weeks apart, which was quite a feat. We were quite proud. Not often that you can get 16 controllers, let alone get the same 16 back two weeks later. So we, we want to thank very much the IA, who were very cooperative. The task, again, in fact, consisted of two tasks. As I mentioned, you had the exit task, where aircraft had to be cleared to their respective exit points. But you also had the conflict resolution task. We had three dependent measures, or three factors. These are independent variables, actually. Complexity, levels of automation, and conformance. Complexity, over the course of Simba and Pogma, we were able to dial in traffic level, and we used traffic in the end as the simplest proxy for, for complexity level. As I said, there are upwards of 100 different factors that have been identified. The percentage of in, uh, ascending and descending, proximity to uh, sector boundaries, things like this, that drive complexity. But the tried and true, the biggest consistently reliable factor underlying complexity is simply the number of aircraft on screen. So we decided to keep it simple and dial in traffic levels where we could, on the basis of workload reports, Simba and Pumba, define high, realistically high and low levels. Levels of automation, again, we defined as management by consent. That is, robot will do it if I say yes. Management by exception, robot will do it um, unless I jump in and say, no, don't do that. One asterisk here is that for practical reasons, actually for, for sort of theoretical reasons later on, 
we collapsed letters, uh, levels of automation um, for the analysis. And the reason for that is one of the advisors to this project, Roger Parasuraman, has been very prolific in automation theory and was a consultant to the project and admitted along the way that, well, he never had been comfortable with that distinction in practice because if you think about it, the difference is very subtle. The difference between management by consent and management by exception. As we created automation, you had a 15 second period in which automation's advice would be up. Hey, turn right 15 degrees. The only difference between the two was what happened at the end of that 15 seconds. Either the automation would auto implement or the, the thing would, um, or rather auto uh, implement in the case of management by exception or it would just turn off, go away. It's a very subtle difference. If I do nothing during the 15 seconds, it will go on or it will go off. However, if I accept it during the 15 seconds, there's essentially no difference between, you don't see that difference until the timeout period. If I accept an advisory at level at seven or eight seconds, they look the same. Therefore, we decided to collapse them, especially given that we weren't getting many timeouts, many timeouts in the consent condition. Sorry, can, can we ask a question? Please do. When you explain MBC and MBE, isn't there something in the profession that you always look actively? You, you, I mean, you, you, scre you search the screen for actively taking action, and, and so MBC is more intuitively correct for a controller. You wouldn't just wait it out because that's not your profession to wait it out. Your profession is to act. That could be an influence here. That uh, MBE involves an element of waiting. Um, and uh, not doing. And not doing. Um, and in a sense, in a sense, it's also knowing that that solution will be implemented at the appropriate time. You that need is, trust. You need trust. Um, some, that's a word that we in, intentionally steered slightly clear of for reasons of this project, but a very important one. Um, but yes, it's, it's, it's a very odd, um, um, it, it's very odd in theory to, to have the controller sitting there doing nothing in an MBE, knowing that at the end of those 15 seconds, the thing will auto implement. Well, but I have to do nothing? Well, ignore it and know that it will, it will auto implement at the appropriate time. And you could be right that it's, it's a very foreign way of working to a controller who's accustomed to being active. And then conformance, which was again identified as high conformance, that it, is, it agrees perfectly with the way the controller worked before, because it is their own performance replayed for them. Or it's low conformance, still a workable solution, but not conformal to their very way of working. Because it's not a parent solution, it happens to have been Dirk's solution. Dirk, the, the colleague who solved it in a slightly different way than did Bert earlier. Resolution advisories came in the form of heading, as you saw before, those, those vectors, or speed. Again, and I'm sorry I couldn't show this because of the video, but you saw this represented by an increasing or decreasing radius diameter resolution advisory or a combination of the two. Advisories were presented for 15 seconds which raises the question of timing. This was among the many areas that the project wrestled with was how and when to present an advisory. If you think about it, it's actually a very tricky thing. You can't do it too early and you can't do it too late. You don't want to do it after the controller has already made a solution. An advisory is irrelevant then. So determining when to show it and how long to show it, because it's the same, we show a resolution and the same resolution stays up there for 15 seconds. But that's actually giving a static resolution to what is a dynamic developing process. So how long do you adjust that, that period of uh, advice? Why are the low level change advisories? That was one of the simplifying assumptions we made. Working with humans is difficult. Working with air traffic controllers is difficult. Trying to not show them uh, photographs, but in fact trying to show some dynamic scene. This was all sort of, it was the, you know, the, the classic struggle between experimental control. Um, we had to make some simplifying assumptions. There was no wind. There was no RT. They interacted by push button. Yeah, no, but so you've eliminated a major form of, of resolution. Absolutely. Which, uh, I can understand uh, no wind, but uh, no left changes. That seems to be... Uh... Yep. 
Guilty as charged. Yeah, it was. I'm sorry, it was? It's like removing and asking somebody to do a task with, with one arm or one hand or something. Yep. Well, but I mean, that's the nature of uh, simulation, isn't it? We bring them in, throw a new tool at them, and the real world, they, they would have had more than 15 minutes training, three hours training with a new tool. We ask them to forget their old ways of working. We ask them to pretend that uh, Crosshair or uh, KLM123 is actually a 747, when they know that call sign, and they know it's a uh, Boeing uh, 7-6, or they know it's a 320. Yeah. The sequence, basically we went through the prequel study in which controllers provide the, the resolutions. We extracted the vectors, came back for the replay study. Came up with uh, six dependent measures here. First was acceptance, simply did they accept or not? And one evolving thought we had over the course of the project was this distinction between acceptance and agreement. You can accept something without agreeing with it. If an experimenter or a manager is telling you use that automation, you might accept it though you don't agree with it. If there's time pressure, you might accept but not agree with it. This sort of thing. So we wanted to break out the two. In the end, we came up with a uh, modification of the NASA CARS controller acceptance rating scale that we used. Acceptance was simply the binary yes, no, did they use it or not, expressed as a count and acceptance ratio. Workload was on a 1 to 100 scale at the end of every two minute session. Response time refers to the time to accept or reject advisories. We had a questionnaire, Likert scale one to five, strongly agree to strongly disagree. And we had uh, some debriefs where we actually sat them down, audio recorded after their entire session and got some feedback on the strategies they were using, what their attitudes were with respect to automation and so on, what they thought of the traffic, the realism and those aspects. And by the way, yeah, controllers consistently said, yeah, this was very unrealistic. Um, we realized that from the outset, but again, that's sort of experimental rigor or operational realism. Um, you know, which do you want? Briefly, I'd like to go over some of the results now. First, in terms of acceptance and agreement. What you see here is that uh, roughly 76% of conformal resolutions versus 56. I might have those numbers uh, off by a point or two. Roughly 70, call it 75 versus 55 percent of advisories were accepted, that is used under conformal and non-conformal conditions. Good, we were encouraged to see that. Controllers were actually more likely to accept solutions when those agreed with their way of working because it was a replay of what they had done. In terms of agreement, they also tended to agree more with conformal resolutions. So if, if, you, if you start the exercise and you have all the aircraft at given positions, but after a while with interacting with the targets, the situa traffic situation will actually look a little bit different for each next coming conflict. Very true. This gets to the question of realism also and the, the eternal struggle between how do you run a good experiment and how do you make it realistic? And the compromise we, compromise we made in that um, area was to limit the length of the, um, the trials initially to two minutes um, and to script conflicts, trying to script conflicts because we wanted to keep it somewhat realistic. We wanted to have controllers free to interact with traffic, but we didn't want to tempt them into interacting with traffic and mucking up things and creating a new, essentially a new scenario at 90 seconds than the next person had at 90 seconds. And we did that by basically having noise aircraft that weren't likely to interact. There was no obvious reason for them to muck around with the peripheral aircraft. Um, and it turns out to have worked well, that is, we left them free to interact with the traffic as they wanted, but in fact, they tended not to. In only a few cases did they mess around with the, the, the peripheral traffic, the noise traffic, as we called it. So we were lucky in that way. But you, don't, you have not come up with a measurement of that effect. The muck around effect? I mean, if you would have an overlay of two exercises and, and the same controller, and, and you would look at when they rejected, you, you, you could measure to what extent the situation was actually exactly the same or not. I'm going to go out on a limb and I say that I think that in the end we, everything we used was identical in terms of noise 
aircraft positions. That is, um, because it was early on, and you can argue about the realism of that, because it happened early in the evolving scenario, and because we had scripted the aircraft to be where they were, that is, the conflict pair uh, was, was obvious, or the conflict group was obvious, and the noise, there was no reason to touch those, the noise aircraft. Because of those manipulations, um, we didn't find that controllers, in effect, ended up with different scenarios. Okay. Um, now, there, can be, there are other differences we can discuss in terms of when they selected things, but basically at that point we had taken our snapshot, we had gotten the data, and, and um, uh, the scenario is over as far as we were concerned. But I think that there weren't um, many differences to speak of. How long would the exercise last? Two minutes, initially. In the, I, I mentioned there was the, the manual and then the automatic, the phase one in Shannon and the phase two. So where we, two minutes to change uh, Every two minutes, um, we had a new scenario. Okay. I'm sorry, I should have been clearer on that. These were two minute scenarios that ran for reasons of the capturing in phase one. During that time, um, the conflict was scripted fairly early on also. Again, you can question the realism of that, but it's always a struggle to try to, um, to do this because you can't run for three hours and, and end up with a, um, an identical picture for two controllers. How many scenarios were there? Sixteen in total. They were based on four baseline scenarios. And um, one of the uh, things we had to do, one of the issues we had was uh, how are we going to replay scenarios? How are you going to replay without controllers recognizing the call signs, the scenario, the flow patterns, and everything? And the approach we came up with involved rotating um, 45 degrees, turning a square into a diamond, changing call signs. What had been Speedbird 123 was now Lufthansa 456. Same aircraft, same position. Um, and we reasoned the closure angles, the traffic geometry, if you will, was the same just rotated. Um, the manipulation seems to have worked. It came up in debrief that controllers didn't, in fact, notice um, this manipulation so much. They didn't notice that they had been seeing the same thing replayed. While I'm at it, I should also mention they didn't notice their own replays, um, for what that's worth. Um, we, you know, we let the cat out of the bag during debriefs, but we had to tell them, listen, we have 15 more of your colleagues coming through. Please stay quiet for the next week. But did you notice that we actually replayed? No, not a single one of them had. Let's go back to where we were, which was here. Looking at the complexity and conformance. Basically, what you see is that um, controllers are more likely to, well, you know what, let me go to a, um, a combined view of this, which I think makes it a bit clearer. Let's first look at the acceptance and how that's impacted by both conformance non-conformal, i.e. your colleague's solution versus your own. And complexity, high or low, traffic high or low. What you see here is that um, under low complexity conditions, conformal displays are uh, accepted more often. Not surprising. Nor was it surprising that if you then throw in more traffic, that tendency is, is even greater. Um, we love to see this, this uh, though the interaction was not significant. Um, this trend was absolutely in the direction our, our hypotheses um, had predicted. That controllers will like their own resolutions, i.e. Will, will use, will accept their own resolutions more often. And particularly under um, time constraints. When you look at agreement, it's a bit of a different picture. Look what's happening. They like their own conformal solutions, that is they agree with them, um, more often, and these were standardized within controllers because there were differences from one to the next. We standardized and made these all z-scores on the same scale. Anyway, they agreed with their own solutions more, but under high traffic, that effect was slightly less pronounced. Again, this trend was, was not significant, but it, it led us to speculate that this, the combination of these two graphs might be uh, highlighting that distinction between acceptance and agreement that we talked about. That um, they might not be evaluating under high time pressure. Um, they accept it, but they don't really evaluate it. Here they have the time to evaluate, and they like their own solutions more. Under high pressure, they just accept it, but don't have the time to agree with it or not quite as much. 
I don't know. I'm not going to draw any firm conclusions from it. But suffice it to say that certainly in terms of acceptance, it's in the uh, direction we expected. In terms of response time, conformal solutions were led to faster response times than did uh, non-conformal solutions. Summarize results. You might like your results by the dependent or the independent. However you want them, they split out both ways. Same results here on either side of this vertical line. Basically, in terms of conformance, conformance, that is when solutions were the same as what you had done before, you tended to accept them more, you tended to agree with them more, and it reduced your response time. In terms of complexity, complexity increased agreement. That is, you tended to agree when things are complex, increased acceptance, and decreased response time. I should say workload also. Workload was significantly increased by complexity, which is not a trivial result. It was our hope in having tweaked the traffic loads that we would actually see a difference in workload, rated workload results. Some conclusions from the, uh, the third trial. We were happy to see that conformance, in fact, was uh, important in terms of acceptance and agreement, and uh, also played a part in response time. There was no interaction between the two. Uh, we got very positive feedback on this SSD interface, which is still under display. It was, although it was the test bed for the project, it was really secondary to the, the Mufasa um, research questions, but it was encouraging for the work at TU Delft to see that um, it could reduce workload according to um, uh, the questionnaire results. But also that controllers were far, uh, reporting that they were far more likely to use speed. These were en route controllers who don't tend to use speed clearances. But they found that this, this interface, which facilitated uh, speed resolutions, really made it um, uh, much easier and more useful. Realism, yes, low. No flight levels and all of the other uh, criticisms duly noted. Um, <coughs> scenarios were not recognized. And as I mentioned earlier, their, their own uh, resolutions, in fact, weren't recognized after the fact. Broader lessons learned. First, controllers did differ in strategies. Some of you might have known that already. We weren't convinced uh, at the outset that there would be um, such differences. Um, but they did, which was interesting to us and critical for the experimental design. Had we not found that, we would have had to come up with some sort of a gold standard, uh, other workable solution. Um, we didn't want to have to do that. Uh, our initial thinking, we had a uh, controller on staff. Um, one of the, the project team uh, was an IA controller, he still is. And um, the plan had been for him to craft um, solutions and we were hoping that we could let it evolve naturally and that controllers would show some variability and we could just extract non-conformal alternatives from from naturally from the environment. Um, yes, acceptance agreement might be tapping different things. Again, the uh, levels of automation distinctions can be subtle. Again, the only difference really between management by consent and management by exception is what happens after the 15 second timeout in our case. Um, and very big point was when do you give an advisory? How long do you give it for? Can't give it too early, can't give it too late. It's a static thing, a st static resolution to what is an evolving scenario. Um, and in that conform conformance is not binary. It wasn't simply conformal or not. Um, in the end, we, we saw a range and in the end had to come up with sort of levels of conformance. We realized that sort of perfect uh, conformance might be when a controller says 20 knot speed increase head at 15 um, degree uh, heading change in, in, to the right. Um, a second level might be when, uh, okay, the type and the change, okay, heading turn to the right. Uh, you agree on that, but not necessarily uh, how, what angle. Um, or it's a heading turn or not. Do they agree on the type of resolution? Um, and sort of the lowest level, do they even pick the same aircraft? So we had to sort of come up with a schema for uh, categorizing those. And uh, in the end came up with four levels of conformance, but broke those into a, a binary split into two. But uh, the, the point from that is simply it's not conformal or not. It could be a little more, I think a little more like Dirk than I do like Bernd um, kind of thing. 
On the basis of this, we revised our model a little bit, also because over the intervening year, as it happens, we came across some new research that's done in 2012, 2011, 2012, into trust, into automation, and specifically into the tendency to use automation. We're coming to see that strategy, in fact, is two things. You've got an operational sort of strategy, but you've also got automation use strategy, and this tendency, the decision to drive to use automation or not, is basically driven by three things as we see it. Sort of the context, are you forced? Do I have to? There's no time. I've got to say yes to the box right now. To conformance, the second factor, which is a yes, it's thinking like I am okay. And the third, which is uh, this tendency, do you tend to use it? And uh, this is an area in which the team is uh, actually intending to, to focus on through some academic research, uh, just kicking off now at TU Delft into um, tendency. Um, what is the source? Um, what's the pedigree? Do you trust it? And there's a lot of uh, work, some of it quite recent, into that, into uh, the concept of ethopia. There's a, a word for you this morning. If nothing else you've learned, maybe a new word. Ethopia, not the nation in East Africa, but eth, oh, uh, you have to look it up. I don't remember how to spell it. But it refers to uh, empathy and the tendency to apply human rules to automated interactions, um, when in fact there's good empirical evidence that the two are judged differently. Um, um, I'm, I treat a machine by the, the visible performance, um, but I judge Gabor by the, um, what I think, uh, more by knowledge. Knowledge of him as a nice guy. Um, he didn't mean to actually throw that knife at me just then. Um, whereas a machine is judged, uh, all you know about the machine is that it threw a knife at you. The project had a, a lot of challenge, a lot of fun, and wrestled with a lot of issues along the way. First was how to control for, would we find strategic differences and how do we control for them? Would we identify a range of solutions and how do we deal with that degrees of conformance? Again, it's not either yes or no. How would we come up with workable solutions that were correct and appropriate, but just not the solution you would come up with? How do we tune the scenarios in a way, in terms of workload and other things, that made automation useful, that the solutions weren't trivial? Actually, selecting automation would be an attractive thing. Could we present replays as automation and get away with it? Controllers, would controllers recognize their own? How could we avoid them recognizing their own scenarios and solutions from before? Dissemination activities covered four, and, and apologize for the small font, particularly to the video. We made presentations at four conferences, ATM relevant conferences. Well, the first is ATAX, broader than just aviation, Barcelona 2011. Presented at CSR Innovation Days, and most recently at the ISAP, Ohio 2013. So, where do we go from here? The team definitely has the feeling that for every door we've closed, we've opened up two others. That's part of the fun of research sometimes. As uh, economist Veblen said, the outcome of any serious research can only be to make two questions grow where only one grew before. Immediate research questions for us that are going to be addressed by the team. Why did controllers reject 25% of their own solutions? That's really the standout result from this and the surprising thing. Why did controllers one quarter of the time say, that solution is no good, when in fact it was a replay of what they had just done. It's fascinating to me, but we don't know what it means exactly. We'd like to think that was a sign of automation bias, but we have to face the potential confound of intracontroller variability. Controllers might simply not know what they want to do, might not know 10 minutes later. They might not have the same solution that they did before. I might be not excited. That's a positive spin on it. Well, what is your background, by the way? <laughs> There's no bias there. Um, they might be very creative, yes. Um, in fact, if you could argue that if the solution were always the same to a given input, why is there a human needed at all? If it's simply that reductionist, um, couldn't we automate that process just fine? Um, so perhaps some of the noise is in fact creativity is part of the um, learning process. If I do things the same way every time, I never learn. Let's see what happens if I turn uh, it by 15 degrees. Um, could be. It, it could also be, Brian, and I know you're convincing me, uh, you're trying to convince me it's not the case, but it could be that by changing the scenario slightly, by rotating that by 45 degrees, perhaps 
you've introduced subtle differences that are noticeable to the controller but not to the experimenter. Yep. Debrief suge results suggest the other, uh, otherwise. Um, that's all we have to go on. We asked uh, them, and uh, according to them, it wasn't, and in fact, uh, one of them reported they didn't even notice the uh, square to diamond rotation. But they also didn't notice that those were scenarios that they had dealt with Correct, before. correct. Could be a recognition. And why, I mean, the, the, could the be that, they, that they haven't recognized it before. <coughs> no, but I mean, the recognition of yeah. something they work with daily. One yeah, of the setups. But the other setup is not part of their airspace. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? If they have a, a similar conflict like one of them, in their own airspace, but not at all the other one. Mm -hmm. And they have a standard solution for the one they recognize mm -hmm. compared to re the real environment. They might tend to use that one or set that one more often in one of the scenarios, but I don't know if you saw differences like that. It could also just be a question of scan, because can controllers look from aircraft to aircraft, you're constantly looking at uh, geometries of aircraft, and if you look in a different order, Mm. you might get a different mental picture of which a problem needs resolving sooner. And you can look at the same conflict twice in a different scan order and come up with a different solution. Mm. It actually doesn't surprise me in the least. Another question. What were the differences between the different 16 different controllers? Because you had an average when you showed it to us. But how broad was the span? I'd have to go back to the original data, the report there, of which is sitting over there. anybody who accepted all the proposals, or were they no. all close to... Seven? I don't believe so, no. No. But I, I'm going to have to take that up offline. And one way in which we intend to look at this is to run subsequent manual scenarios. That is, we always went, and again this is a confound, from manual to automated because we had to for reasons of what we were doing. But what if we gave them follow-on the same scenario again and asked for their resolution the second time, rotated or not, would they come up with the same thing? as a way of looking at. And are they biased against automation or biased against advice? You could argue that, uh, and there's that word, that's how you spell it, by the way. You could argue that they rejected advisories not because they were coming from a machine, but because they were advisories. And I don't like anybody telling me how to do my job. That's a possibility that we couldn't control, didn't control for experimentally, but one very simple way of doing it would have been to vary the instructions, tell a portion of the group, listen, uh, your colleagues just came up, your colleague chose this solution. We're going to be presenting you uh, your colleague's solutions um, as opposed to an automation's solutions. Um, to see whether there's a systematic difference that way. Where else will we be going from here? We're going to publish, present, and preach the past and the ongoing results to anyone who listened to us, hopefully to other domains outside of ATM, and to try to build on the empirical data, but also the theoretical, build on that, that model. I thank you, my time is up. Uh, thank you for your attention and the, the good questions. It was a very fun project, um, very challenging project, and it's been fun to interact with the team along the way. So I open it up to questions now. So you started off by talking about the Turing test. So imagine that uh, we created an air traffic control robot and asked uh, a human controller, what do you think of this air traffic <laughs> control robot and its performance? From what you said, what I infer is that at most, we could expect the human being to accept the robot 75% of the time. Uh, is that? Is that? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So even if even if the robot is a clone of the controller, the controller will accept the the clone or the robot at best 75% of the time, which seems to suggest to me 
that if we're going towards this automation, we don't really need controllers. I, I always imagined that we would need controllers to accept robots or automation 99% or 90% of the time. But it seems at best we can hope they will accept the automation the order of 75% of the time, which appears to me to be you know, quite achievable. Okay, so positive lesson is, yeah, we can, get, we can get that far. Mind you, that was done with perfect automation. That was done with automation that absolutely matched. Imagine what would happen if a controller saw the robot make one move that had not really matched the way they would think. What is this machine thinking about? Trust is destroyed. You know, there's, there's also the school of thought that um, and there are a number of researchers that recently have come out with this observation that we tend to trust automation, and I don't know the, the data behind it very well, we tend to trust automation more than humans. We hold it up to a gold standard, but trust declines much more rapidly um, in the case of a screw up. You're more inclined, if I tell you this is iOS 7, new app, you'll say, ooh, must work right, as opposed to a person you just met. But the first time the app screws up, uh, it's dropped very far in your book. Okay, but on the assumption that the automation does achieve separation always, and that there is no screw-up, and it's really just a question of do I approve the style, or does this conform to what I expect? But I wouldn't say just. I think that's the harder part. Because uh, basically, ATM is a large solution space. There are a lot of ways to solve the same thing. And if you see a device not doing it the way you would, I think you're disinclined to like it. It's not that, oh, well, it doesn't do it the way I would, but it resolves it okay. I don't know. I don't know. But it seems that if it does it exactly the way I would do it, I will only accept it 75% of the time. Yeah. During your presentation, I had uh, in my mind lots of small bit and pieces and questions. But the general question is to me, you take situations out of the broader scale from the whole airspace, and... Uh, Resolve the conflicts there according to the to the traffic which is flying close to the aircraft around the the, the, the conflicts. The higher number of the higher the traffic load, the more conflicts appearing. Mm. You put the controller with these fifteen seconds under the pressure, decide whether you take the decision of the of the system or ignore it and try to think over himself what to do. The more the traffic, the less probability the controller starts to think. He tends to accept what the the system doing. And the more he's doing so, the more he's losing the situation awareness in the airspace. So the system gradually taking over the control of the airspace at the moment that the control of the human may be needed the most. Because he's losing the picture sooner but surely, slowly but surely, by not judging the system and appearing in the high traffic without looking, without knowing what is going on in the airspace. And that is an abnormal traffic coming, somebody. Not, I'm not talking about the, the distress or whatever, just the aircraft flying slower than it's tight normally doing so. So the computers start to do bad decisions, let's say, or not the best ones, but the controller is not able to judge it anymore. He's just looking and waiting when the traffic is calming down and he can take the big picture back. Do you know what I mean? Yes, yeah. And that's the, the acceptance versus agreement distinction. You might be driven to accept something because of the high pressure, whether you agree with it or not. Um, and you don't have time to evaluate whether you agree with it or not. It's the human being. Yeah. Tend to keep, take the help when it, he needs the help. But yeah. taking the help, yeah. losing the picture. Yeah. Yeah, and again, that's why the, the context is important in the decision to accept it or not, to use it or not. We thought sometimes you're just driven by uh, um, the complexity, or we have to admit in our case by an experimenter, the presence of an experimenter there. Controllers, uh, if anything, uh, we might have overestimated the tendency to accept um, because they must have assumed the purpose of our experiment was to try out new automation. So they were probably predisposed to accept it where they might not in real life, if you had to guess. If anything, we might have over overestimated that in the end. Please. The SSD, um, did it only look at single pairs to make its judgment, or did it actually look beyond it uh, to, for example, if you turn right, do you create another conflict? Was yes. Multiple conflicts? Yes, it did do that. It considered multiple. So you, um, you, know, you might have seen the bands um, display different regions. Those corresponded to different uh, conflict paths with different aircraft. 
I have, a, I have a question on the, the, the solution I mean, that I proposed with the speed uh, or change heading. Uh, why there was no change factor because not used very much? Or I'm sorry. With uh, so the proposal for the advice uh, to the, on the resolution, that was uh, speed heading and combined. Right. But not altitude. But no altitude change. Why? No. Uh, again, that was among the simplifying assumptions we made that we were going to keep it uh, all at the same flight level, um, and that's a, that's a limitation, a simplification for experimental reasons. Did you think of the possibility to actually? teach each controller their own strategics and then measuring the acceptance. Do you see what I mean? If you, no. if you have recorded how they normally do a thing, mm -hmm. you then tell them this is how you normally do the thing. So they are actually trained on their own method. Would that increase the acceptance? It would certainly predispose them to doing the same thing again. Um, I would be afraid that would taint the results, frankly. I mean, if, we, if they turned right 15 degrees the first time and we sat them back down a week later and said, remember, you turned right 15 degrees. Okay, go ahead. Interact naturally now. <laughs> no, but I, I'm, I'm more serious than that because when, when we train students, we normally um, don't realize that we all have different strategies and different 3D uh, visualization methods uh, as controllers. So if you and your student have different cognitive views of what is going on, you can actually not really communicate very well between mm -hmm. a, mm -hmm. an instructor and a student. So if, if you know the other one's way of thinking, you will be a, a better teacher, in fact. And, and it might be that controllers are not aware of their mental way of thinking, but if somebody tells them this is how you work, this is your way of creating your aware situational awareness. Could be, beyond the scope of our project, I think. But it brings up an anecdote. Years ago when I first learned about this, an Amsterdam uh, tower controller explained to me uh, one night, I have an easier time handing off to Hans than Franz at the end of my shift because, you know, Hans and I think the same way. Um, he sits over my shoulder for you know, 10 minutes, whatever it is, at shift handover, and he thinks like I do. Franz, you know, I've got to explain everything because he just doesn't get the picture the same way. He's fine, but we just don't solve in the same way. Um, but I, yeah, I'm, I, I put the question to you, but I think it's, it was kind of beyond the scope of what we could do. We had to limit things a bit. I'm not a controller, um, but if, if I were... Um put in the same position, um, I wonder, would you consider the dimension of responsibility? If you give me a system that helps me deciding, and I tend to use a system more and more, a bit like uh, Gabo said, because you put me in a situation where I need to solve things more and more often, and by accepting more and more often, I lose the picture, uh, I will delegate more, uh, but the other element might be that uh, if I delegate, do I lose responsibility? And therefore, I will delegate more because I feel less responsible. Yeah, uh, there, are, there are a lot of issues at play. Responsibility um, in the legal sense also. Um, you know, who's, uh, if I delegate, if I don't delegate, who's responsible if something goes wrong with the automation? I assume that is nothing should go wrong. I assume that you say all these decisions computer propose 100% sure. That needed to be judged by the controller, I presume. So it shouldn't be a mistake in this picture, because then it's a completely different picture. I would never let the system, not 100% reliable, take a decision, especially if it is automatically implemented if I do not anything. What machine is 100% reliable? So that's... <laughs> <laughs> Not that. <very. laughs> take the responsibility then. The system decides and responsibility is yours. That's On the same way, uh, um, I mean, there is automation on cars where you can uh, have automatic speed, um, cruise, I mean, cruise, uh, cruise control speed. Uh, and then the, the side effect, I mean, on recent studies, that, that uh, there was a, 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 a safety issue uh, where uh, drivers were less responsible um, and were less uh, aware, you know, uh, after uh, they become more um, tired in short period. Um, it, it helped, but in fact, 
in uh, in uh, one hour, just most of the drivers were less, more tired, tend to, to, to sleep than other. And also the fact that in a dense situation, in high traffic complexity, I would say, then uh, it was not uh, very good because, I mean, the system control your car instead of you are controlling the car. And then there are more conflict, or more risk. Uh, I'm, I, have that, uh, I raised that question here. Uh, do you have figure on the safety said that if there is automation on the system, okay, <coughs> there is a, the, the, the system will provide, but of course the controller could lose the picture in case of if he tend to, to, to accept a lot of, of, the, of the thing. Of course there could be advantage because maybe the system is very reliable and will provide very good, very accurate and safe advice. So then you increase the safety by itself. But okay, you could have side effect on the fact the controller lose the picture and, and, and so on, or he lose the picture, and then when you don't accept the system and you make a proposal, then you can do a mistake because he didn't have the right picture at that time, you know. So do you? It's one question raised more, and sometimes you solve some. Do you tend to do to continue study on the? on safety, or do you have safety uh, figures on, on that? No, to question two. Um, we don't have data on safety, uh, and it's, it's always, an, it's, I, I, in my experience, it's an implicit link you have to make from studies like this, because you cannot collect enough data in a realistic way on losses of separation. How many conflicts are there? They just don't happen often enough. Uh, thankfully, for those of us who fly, um, unfortunately, the, for those of us who are trying to collect uh, data, um, no, we don't have data on, on the safety. Um, and in terms of what you can realistically explore in laboratory settings like this, I think we're always going to be somewhat limited. You have to make an, an implicit link, as I say. Workload is higher, or um, situation awareness is lower, therefore there is a link to uh, potential safety issues. But in terms of actually counting uh, crashes, losses of separation, um, it just, the data aren't rich enough, I think. I have a question referring to this intervariability. If you had 16 controllers, did you have a chance to ask for feedback? Why did they refuse this 25% of, the, of, of their own solution? No, we didn't actually ask them that in so many words. It would be interesting to see. Um, we mentioned to them what had happened after the debrief. So we collected data from them. We then told them what happened. And w we chatted in the hallway, of course. Um, but we didn't collect in any systematic way. Okay, why did you disagree with yourself? Because at that point, we didn't realize that they had. I imagine it's a post-analysis, but I mean, it would be very interesting to... It would be, I agree. Um, my suspicion is they wouldn't have been aware of it, but I don't know. I'm just wondering, um, does it actually matter? Does any of it matter? Because <laughs> does, it, does the whole concept matter? Because we know that people adapt to automation very, very quickly, and we know that through experimentation. We also know through our experience. If you have a, you know, a TomTom -tom or a Garmin or whatever, you know that your reaction to automation changes pretty quickly after using it. And not only that, what you consider acceptable and what you consider might be that, that certainly will change as well. And what you consider might be conforming will change also, depending ultimately whether it does its job. Yep. Good enough. So we, we satisfy, we kind of, we say, well, it, it's good enough. Um, so does it really matter if it does it in a way that we think we would have done it? And we don't really know how we would have done it clearly. Um, I grant you it might not be an issue. We've all adapted to iPads and GPS is just fine. Um, transitional era, it might be more of a transitional era issue than a, a mature state issue. Um, how do we get from here to there? I don't know. And this is a point that you brought up, Dirk, that it might not matter uh, long term in the future. And it might not matter very short term. I mean, if you just observe your experience, it changes so quickly that now people drive into rivers because their TomTom -tom is telling them that's the way that they should go, right? So I honestly went like this maybe. to a book recently. I started to go like yeah. this. Yeah, yeah, children. children. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter does it with a magazine, but she's... <laughs> <laughs> 
Right. This is this is my favorite way of challenging you, Brian, because this is the, the discussion we had times and times again. And I think uh, what actually happens is that automation does change the way controllers work. Now you had the you had the graph of uh, how often uh, do you control your Android controllers did speed control never. Controllers don't do speed control because it is cognitively very demanding for them. In most cases, however, it is more efficient. Speed control is probably the most efficient way of, uh, of controlling traffic in most cases. So automation, and, and you had that actually as one of your results, automation changes the way in which controllers do. It leads them, to, for example, to do more speed control because the co some of the cognitive burden of calculating where an aircraft will be so many uh, minutes uh, in advance is taken from them. Okay, so if you are, in, if if you're building a system to function in such a way that it is accepted by the human because it is conformant to what they have done before, you're introducing a degree of conservatism in in the system that may potentially make it uh, suboptimal. Yep, that's that's a, a plausible view. Um, you shouldn't design to the way the human works. You should design uh, to the way the task should be done, and the human will adapt. So how can these two challenges be married, making a system acceptable to the user because it behaves a little bit like the user would, would have done and therefore he likes it more and therefore he uses it more and therefore he gets more experience and is more likely to use it. On the other hand, not making the system too static, too, too conservative. A couple thoughts. One is transparency. Let the automation show what it's considering and not considering. Um, for instance, in, in automation like this, where it's actually strategic, um, not not a very simple sort of deterministic uh, app response on an iPad, but um, something like this. That's a um, you want to know whether it had considered the wind uh, and and other factors. Um, that's one um, transparency. The other issue is uh, just disappeared from my head. Um, we'll come back to it. But by by telling the uh, letting the human know what it was. Thinking and not thinking is, is one way um, for automation to uh, to maybe ease that transition. What about to, to go into now? Okay, this is an experiment. It, it fascinates me. I've done it, but. What about to to go into real environments now, which would be far more interesting to look at? Well, what actually did happen when you introduced automation that's comparable, maybe outside of air traffic, but maybe inside to the kind that you're looking at now? Yeah. Then, it sh then maybe you'll get a sense of, does it actually matter to go into the field? And then it may save you a lot of kind of heartache devising, you know, really complicated experiments. Yeah, I and mean, we wanted to address the question of, is there, I mean, we talk often of there's an automation bias, controllers won't accept automation and so on. And the reasoning was, given that the, the automation is going to become more strategic, acceptance could ironically be that much more important. Um, if it's going to be an intelligent partner and you have the ability to disregard it, there becomes this almost uh, paradox of how do you accept it before you use it and how do you use it before you accept it? How do you ever build that, that cycle? Anything else? Probably more than one question you added. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Following your statement there, you had one question, now you have two, I think you have more than two. Yeah. <laughs> Just a question, Please. isn't it to do with responsibility? If the manufacturer of the advisory was responsible for bad advisories, then a human is more li <coughs> likely to to take the, the advice, because if it's wrong, they're not responsible. I don't know. I don't know, and I don't know whether everybody would be sort of similar in that attitude. Um, okay, Talis made the box. Uh, I don't have to worry because Talis is going, so need some engineer Talis is going to jail uh, if these things hit. I don't know. And furthermore, how do we set that line legally? I mean, where is the responsibility? Um, well, it seems unfair to give the controller responsibility when it's the tool that's giving the advisory. Yeah. But, I mean, that question comes very often on the responsibility of the manufacturer or the manuf responsibility of the controller or whatever. But, in fact, uh, you still have that today. I mean, if you have a system, an HMI, used by a controller, and then the aircraft is not displayed at the right position because there is a bug, software bug, 
then I mean it's a mistake in, in the system. Who is responsible of that? So it's the same as giving a wrong advisory. It's it's worst. But you could have I mean an aircraft at, at the wrong position even today, for a while. So. So so that that case already exists today. Coming back to your question, came back to me now, in addition to transparency, preview and flexibility. If you can play with the system and it's resilient and doesn't break. If you can basically toy around and become familiar with it in a way that's not breaking, you build up trust that way. Um, so if you can probe it uh, just to see what happens. Um, so I mean, the system should be transparent and should be uh, playful. Actually linked to that particular issue and um, I've been thinking a little bit about your use of the word strategic and automation becoming more strategic. And assuming I'm thinking strategic in the same term as you, we already do have conflict pros, medium-term conflict detection, which is used on a daily basis all over the world, which the system has a look, identifies, comes up with a kind of solution which the team adopts, hopefully to smooth the flow of traffic. And then conversely, at the right at the end, closer to what you're talking about, you have STCA, which is, sits there invisible to controllers until something goes wrong and it pipes up and says, oh, you might want to think about this. Now, both of those tools are in daily use and are actually completely accepted by controllers as being normal automation support to their daily task. Is that so very different to what you're looking at here? First of all, strategic is not the best term for what we're using because it connotes to some people a time scale. Uh, strategic is not, is, is not uh, contrasted with tactical in our case. I think cognitive is a better word um, in the sense that it's not a simple deterministic thing, it's more akin to playing chess. There are a lot of factors, there's, um, you've got to consider the wind and, and other things um, that may or may not be taken into account. So um, it's taking different sources of information, um, looking at their possibly nonlinear interactions and coming up with a, a, a solution. It's a lot um, more involved mentally than simply extrapolating straight line of flight, for instance. And that's really, strategic is used in that sense here. Cognitively demanding might be a better way to put it. Um, I don't know whether that addresses your question, but I, I'm apologizing for the use of the term a bit, because in the ATM world it is often contrasted with long-term, near-term, strategic, tactical. Okay, if there are no further questions, uh, thank you very much, Brian, for this uh, interesting talk. Thank you also for the friendly cooperation in the project. I really enjoyed working with you and also with Debbie. And bon appétit.